Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our afternoon presentation. Um, before I go any further, I just want to point out a couple things as I look out there. I see pretty much everybody here is familiar with our facilities, but if not, if you do need restrooms, there are the men's and women's here, as well as up in the gathering space. If you want to get up at, at any point and help yourself to the lemonade, coffee, or water, juice, or the, uh, the, the cookies, or the sandwiches, do so as well. Um, if, before I forget, there is um, on the table, right behind the table back here, back behind these guys, um, there's a, a scrapbook on there that shows some amazing pictures and history of our, um, our school here, as well as a minutes book dating back to the early 1900s. So if you want to read or try to read some of the writings that, uh, that came up with the, the parish there, that is available too for you as well. So uh, without further ado, let's begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Lord, our faithful God, we come to you today asking for your guidance, wisdom, and support as we begin this meeting. Help us to engage in meaningful discussion. Allow us to grow closer as a group and nurture the bonds of our school and faith formation community. Fill us with your grace, Lord God, as we make decisions that will affect the students, staff, faculty, alumni, and friends of our school. And continue to remind us that all that we do here today, all that we accomplish, is for the pursuit of truth, for the greater glory of you and the service of humanity. We ask these things in your name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So once again, I'd like to welcome all of you for our afternoon uh, presentation, and thank you all for coming. Uh, we appreciate you, um, that you are here, being here this afternoon, and hope to learn uh, about some of the challenges and, and opportunities that we face uh, with St. Anne's Catholic School. And we look forward to your sharing of your reactions and observations to this information that we will um, soon present. We want to keep our meeting for to one hour and 45 minutes as promised. And so to help with this, um, I appreciate Hal giving me a little note thing here to follow along so I don't ramble on and just talk about things in general and just waste time, um, kind of like I'm doing right now. Um, our purpose is to explore a proposal, uh, a proposal to repair. Um, improve, expand, or build a new education facility as part of a comprehensive feasibility study. The details of this study will be shared in the early portion of our presentation. Collectively, whatever we decide to do, we must work to shape the future to ensure that we can provide for the education to current members and the great generations who will join us. Once we share this information with you, we need to listen to your comments and questions. We will try to respond with the best information we have at this time. If we do not have an answer at this meeting, we'll work to find the answer and share the information with all parishioners. I'm very glad that you have joined us to learn about the proposal and then to share your ideas as we continue to explore and responsibly plan for our future. And so I just want to take this time to first introduce our presenters. We first have Mark Lundberg from YHR Partners Architects in Moorhead and then also um, Katie and Hal Johnson from Hal Johnson and Associates in Bloomington. Hal and Katie have worked with our parish for the past several months to help us with the organization, the content and communications in preparations for these meetings. As part of the feasibility study, we have hired them to um, conduct this process. They are now in their 48th year of working with faith communities to help determine ways to strengthen and shape their future. St. Anne's Catholic School now is their 318th project, helping the faith community they serve to raise over $337 million. Now let me turn over to Hal um, and Katie and Mark for this um, ongoing presentation. I'd just like to show this little blurb or share a little blurb that I think is always fascinating. Um, you probably some of you are good uh, Minnesota Gopher men's basketball fans. Their son is Ben Johnson, so um, maybe we could get some good things out of this um, from Ben or something like that for perks or whatever. Just kidding. So welcome, Hal. As I walked up here, I heard the audience say, get tickets, there's money, there's possibilities. Thank you, Father, for the kind introduction. My wife and I are so privileged to be with you today, and this is a wonderful response. I know it's a little bit rainier day, so those of you who are in our agricultural community, it's, it's a, a day that you have to get out of the soil, but thanks so much for coming uh, and giving a portion of that. 
Right away, I'm going to ask our volunteers, uh, actually Chris and uh, Mary and Katie are going to pass out a document to each of you, and they also have some pencils. If you have need something to write with, just raise your hand. They'll make sure that you have something to write with. If you're here as a couple, would you please each take one of the booklets so that you can review it independently, and then you have the opportunity to leave that second copy uh, on your way out this afternoon. We're going to divide our meeting into two halves. The first half, about 45 minutes, is going to review this information, and then the second half will allow for your questions, your comments, your feedback, and that's the most important part of uh, today in our view. Uh, in between those two points, we'll just take a short five-minute break, let you refill uh, refreshments, use the restrooms, and then maybe take a look uh, to my left, your right, at the architectural graphics that are all in the book, but it'll give you a little bit more of a larger view. Before you jump into the booklet, if I could just have your attention for a moment. On the inside front cover, there is a beige sheet, if you would pull that out. I want you to be able to understand what we're asking here. During the course of our presentation, up here to my left, there's a flip chart. We're gonna be recording all of your comments and your questions and any reactions you have uh, on that chart. But in addition, we provided this comment sheet. And if for some reason your booklet does not have that, raise your hand and we'll make sure you get one of the comment sheets. You'll see at the top, we're asking you to write down comments, questions, and reactions about what you learned here today. And then you can leave the sheet on the table if you're ambitious. Just leave it on the registration table upside down on your way out. You can drop it in a collection basket at a forthcoming weekend liturgy. You can deliver it to the school office. There's also a post office address there. And if you are technologically interested, uh, there is an email address. You have room for your comments on the front. Also, the whole backside is available to you uh, if you need it. But then there are three questions at the bottom we're asking you to complete. And I want to assure you, this is anonymous information. You don't have to put your name down, except at the very bottom, if you would like a more personal response from a member of the planning team, obviously we need to know how to reach you. So fill it out uh, at that point. But feel free to make this anonymous. Secondly, let me call your attention up front. Thank you so much for filling out the card, as Katie and others invited you to at the registration. This is the reason why we ask you to fill it out so that we wouldn't be mailing a second copy to your home and wasting resources. And then finally, something that you don't have in your packet, but I'll call your attention to, is a bright yellow card that we're gonna ask you to fill out on your way out this afternoon before we conclude. It's gonna have four statements in there and we're testing your pulse in essence, your reaction to what you learned this afternoon in terms of these comments. So if you're here as a couple, we want each of you to fill it out. You do not sign your name, it's anonymous, and you can just place it upside down on your way out. Okay, enough of an introduction, and Father, thanks for setting the, the housekeeping in terms of where things are. Let's take a look at the first page. You can see the cover page is a feasibility study to invite feedback on options to repair, improve, expand, or potentially construct a new facility for St. Anne's Catholic School and the Faith Formation Program. I'm gonna ask as we go through each page quickly in some areas, we'll slow down in other areas, if you would hold your questions or comments till uh, we get to that point. That'll allow us to get through the entire booklet in that 45 minutes. You can see this is the third of four meetings. We'll have one more session this evening here at 6.30. And then on the right-hand side of, of the first page, is a short letter from the planning team, and they want you to uh, obviously understand the context of why this was created. Back to the left-hand side of page one, that statement, community is at the heart of all Catholic education, not simply as a concept to be taught, but a reality to be lived. And that came from St. John Paul II. Turning to page two, you'll see a table of contents that when you take the booklet home and you wanna reread certain sections or look for certain specifics, that table of contents will guide you. Then we are obviously uh, grateful to the two larger communities, both St. Anne's and St. Catherine's, 
uh, for their part as part of our area Catholic uh, community. Now, page three talks about what we can expect from the feasibility study. It's a kind of a lengthy message. First and foremost, uh, from a total transparency standpoint, I want you to know that uh, our firm, Hal Johnson and Associates, is receiving $9,500 for conducting this study. And that's the work that we have done in the last several months to get us to this point. And then you'll see the other work that we're going to be doing following these four meetings. But it's a flat fee of $9,500. <clears throat> the first couple of paragraphs on page three on the left-hand side, I'll let you review at your own pace. But take a look at the second cross. It says the process will utilize four identical open invitation presentation dialogue meetings where church and school households can learn the facts and information and then offer comments, questions, reactions, hopes, dreams, and concerns. If you follow down two more, it says following the presentation dialogue meetings, we're going to conduct 40 face-to-face -face interviews here at St. Anne's with a cross-section of people who actually attended the meetings. So by your presence today, um, the old adage, 80% of success in anything is showing up. Well, you're here, so you will be part of that pool of a cross-section of folks uh, that we're going to interview. It's going to be a private interview. I will take on a household and might talk to one individual or a couple. Katie will do the same thing in a separate area uh, so that it's private and confidential. You don't have to worry that your name is going to be contact or connected to any particular question because we want this to be anonymous. It's your views beyond what you learn today. It's about a 45 minute process if you're going to be selected from that group. And then you go down one more cross on the left hand side and it says, in addition, written surveys will be mailed to all remaining households who came to the meeting. So again, by the fact you're here this afternoon, you're either gonna be part of the cross section to be interviewed or you'll receive a written survey uh, in the mail. There's also an opportunity to take the survey online if you prefer to do that. The right-hand side of page three talks about some of the benefits of this feasibility study and what you'll get by way of information. I'll let you read that at, all, at your own pace, but let's go down to the last two points on the right-hand side of page three. Hal Johnson and Associates will prepare and present a comprehensive study which includes our report with the recommendations and observations we have. So if I can come back for a moment, the meetings will have its own section, the interviews will have a second section, and the surveys will be a third section. Then after that, we're going to have our observations and recommendations based on what you tell us. We're gonna feed that back to you. The last point says, after your leaders take a look at that information, we believe in total transparency. The entire report and its contents will be made available to any interested parishioner who wants to review it. How will we do that? We'll probably print six or eight reports, number them one through eight, have them available in the parish office, and you would check it out like a library. You'd take out one of them, take it home for three, four days, read it, and then return it for someone else. So that transparency and your feedback is hugely important. But I'll say again, your names are not going to appear in the report, so you're free to share the information. Thanks for letting me go through that detail. Let's turn to page four, and I'm gonna cover this information before I turn this over to Katie to describe the education programs. Let's look at page four, which deals with governance and organization. Every Catholic parish in the Diocese of New Ulm has five corporate board members. The first member is the bishop in place. He is the president of the corporation. The pastor is the vice president of the corporation. And in this case, that's Father Tony. And then you have three other corporate board members. One of them is the vicar general from New Ulm. And then your two trustees here as parish members. One of them is the secretary, the other is the treasurer of the corporation. Those five people are the governance that make the formal decisions, especially for a project of this size. But what they do is they listen from the ground up to the will of the people, and that's the purpose of this feasibility study. 
So you feed your information, your reactions to your parish council and your trustees and pastor, and then they form the final decision that would go to the bishop and the vicar general. So let's take a look at who those folks are. You see your pastor's responsibility, then the trustees are listed in a paragraph, and that's Bruce and Carol. Then your parish council, the finance council, excuse me, those members are on the top right hand of page four. And then of course, there's an important school advisory committee, and those members are listed along with their responsibilities. So those first few pages give you a grounding now, and I wanna turn this over to uh, my colleague Katie, who's gonna talk about the faith formation program and the uh, education in the school. Thank you, Hal. I'm gonna be going through these pages uh, rather quickly, knowing that you can um, delve into them further on your own at home. On page five, it shares the faith formation ministry for our children and adults. Preschool and kindergarten children attend Sunday school, while the first through 12th grade students attend weekend or weekday afternoons and evenings. There are also summer learning opportunities listed and year-round areas for service. You can see enrollment increased from last year to this year. On the right side of the page are the opportunities for adults to continue their faith journey and strengthen their discipleship. In addition, our fraternal organizations and clubs facilitate evangelization through their activities. Let's turn now to page six, where we'll delve into more about the school itself. We concentrate on St. Anne's School, whose mission is to pass on our Catholic faith and an excellent education. They impart on their students that they enter to learn Christ and exit to serve Christ. The four bullets show the vision uh, statement, vision uh, statements for the school, and this lays the foundation for their curricular decisions um, and curricular planning. As you can read, the first school was built nearly 100 years ago and was staffed by the sisters from Good Council Academy. Through the years, additions, including a new gym, have been made to the building. Enrollment peaked in, at 200 in the 1960s when the high school grades were included, but it began to decline um, in the 70s, but the quality of education certainly didn't. St. Anne received its first Minnesota Non-Public School Accrediting Association Award in 1987, and they've recently gone through the accrediting process again. As rural population in the state decreased in the early 2000s, enrollment did dip to 87 students in grades K-6, but with more recent increases in population due to favorable farming, a preschool was added in 2013. Today, enrollment is the highest since the early 2000s. You could look at it as for over 100 years, St. Anne's has averaged 100 students. Let's move to page seven, where you can see some photos of the school in action. At the bottom of the left column, um, you can see that our, the students are enrolled. They represent communities from Wabasso, Wanda, Lucan, Seaforth, Vesta, Redwood Falls, Milroy, and Walnut Grove. That's a broad area to serve. At present, school enrollment represents 81% of total religious education enrollment at St. Anne's Church. Seven years ago, enrollment at St. Anne's totaled 89 students, but today it's just over 100. This is a similar trend at local public school and reflects the growing population in the area. And you can see the table on the right that shows um, the, the enrollment trends over the last few years, as well as the projection for the next two. I'm gonna turn now to page seven. Page eight, excuse me. <laughs> This shows um, the activities that foster faith in action, and they're listed here. These support the mission we read a few minutes ago. Schools have changed a lot in the past 100 years. As I reflect on my own Catholic elementary education and now volunteer in my grandson's first grade classroom, I sense many of those changes are necessary as schools address the 21st century students. St. Anne's has made strides to add state-of-the-art technology, which is so ingrained in those students. In addition to core content, St. Anne's provides additional subjects and differentiated learning for each student's needs. 
As the Chinese proverb says, if you are planning for a year, sow rice. If you are planning for a decade, plant trees. If you are planning for a lifetime, educate people. Finally, on page nine, uh, we show information on the school's finances. The tables on the left show the revenue that was budgeted for last year and its actual revenue received. On the right side is the um, revenue budgeted for this year and year-to-date uh, revenue received. Note that fiscal years end on June 30th of each year. The lower table reflects the expenses budgeted and expended last year and this year to date. I'm gonna read that uh, last paragraph on that left column. The annual cost to educate one child at St. Anne's School ranges from 4,800 to 6,200. About 25% of this expense is subsidized by the parish. Repairs and maintenance of old building structures continue to increase from year to year. The pie chart on the right breaks down the source of funds the school received last year. Starting from the top and going clockwise, the sources are listed and shown in the key in the same order on the right side. The 27% provided by the parish subsidies is the last wedge of the pie. In 1988, the Father Deal Endowment Fund was established. Through generous contributions to the principal, the interest is then used to, to support annual school expenses. For the past two years during the COVID pandemic, um, the school was able to receive uh, funds from the federal government as, as many, many nonprofits did. So that uh, interest wasn't used for school expenses, it was actually reinvested into the fund. Now I'll turn this back to Hal to look at the school's immediate facility needs. to pause for a second on page nine and just tell you the moment Katie said the fund was distributed to the school's principal I thought Mary does not receive 2.4 million dollars <laughs> right? it's that word principal that has two meanings so thank you uh, we just want to make that clear very clear all right let's go to pages 10 and 11 and this kind of sets up in essence, um, what Mark will present from uh, the good work that YHR did to, to uh, outline some of their uh, proposals for remedying the situation. So page 10 talks about immediate needs. What's the most urgent things? Well, as Katie indicated, you're a year away from your 100th anniversary of the uh, school, and it's been 50 years since the last major work was done on the building. So. The, uh, as it says in the second paragraph on the left-hand side of page 10, St. Anne's was built in 1927 with a first story West edition made in 1953. And then you'll see other improvements over the years that have been made. But this paragraph on exterior de deterioration is one of two very urgent issues. First of all, the tuck pointing and, uh, is deteriorating and that's the mortar in between the bricks that is starting to leak or leach water into uh, the area. And it has to be removed, it has to be preserved. In other words, you're taking care of the body from the outside in. We would do this in our own homes or businesses, but this has not been done in 100 years. It's time to get in and take care of that. So the estimated repair would be $300,000. The heating and cooling is the next item. They're almost a one and two. The estimated life of a current boiler is about 20 years, and you're sitting now at exactly 20 years since the last uh, boiler was uh, installed, and it needs to be done in the next couple of years. There's regular repairs uh, that you can see, patches. Besides that, there is no uh, duct work uh, that is contemporary to today to allow fresh air intake and monitor uh, the temperature. And as you go to the top on page 10, uh, on the right-hand column, you'll see there's ranges in temperatures in the winter from 60 degrees to 80. Mary describes the fact that some faculty, if not a number, have to wear their coats. Others would like to take everything off because it's 80 degrees in there. So there's no ways to control uh, the, uh, the heating. 
So that work to remove the boiler, complete current duct work to put fresh air uh, capacity in there for the children and the adults who use the facility and remove any asbestos is approximately a million dollars worth of work. So that's 1.3 million that's absolutely needed. But while also considering that is the question of accessibility. The building as you're going to see in terms of Mark's description has nine different levels. It's because it was cobbled together over time and the teachers are nodding because they know that. Tiny steps here to move here or there. So the question is who among us would love to access the space, but the steps prevent us from doing that. Is that someone who's in a wheelchair? Is it someone who uses crutches? Is it any one of us, and I'm getting there, I'll be 70 years old this November, it's getting tougher and tougher to use steps. So the question is to provide for the children, the youth, the adults, and seniors who want to use the building, should we bring it up to what's called Americans with Disability Act uh, accessibility? And that process would take approximately $3 million to do that work. So let's look down at page 11. This is the cross where we're at. The uh, advisory committee to the school said, it's really time to present all of these facts to the parishioners in our area faith community. That's why we had the session last evening at St. Catharines and we're having two more today and this evening. So fixing and or improving the accessibility, the exterior deterioration and heating and cooling components, as it says on page 11, is approximately 4.5. Why the difference between 4.3 and 4.5? There's some contingencies, some fees, some permits, the architectural work that would have to be done, that's that additional 200,000. So the 4.3 is the straight construction kinds of cost. Then let's go down to the last couple of paragraphs on page 11 on the left-hand side. The following pages, as it said, will introduce you and illustrate several proposed improvements as developed by YHR architects out of Moorhead. Then the cost estimates, I want to stress, are not formal bids. Those of you who do any type of building from a simple bathroom or a room addition or a major building know, if you're ready for bids, you have to start that work within 30 days, 60 days, maybe 90 days at most, depending on today's market. Some bids are only good for 14 days in this particular era we're in. It's blown me away after 48 years of doing this, but that's the reality of today. So you're not ready for bids because you don't have any money in terms of starting this work. So these are intelligent contractor conceptual cost estimates that obviously could change once you reach bids. So these last two paragraphs, page 11, why now and why me? We're standing on the shoulders of those who built that building 100 years ago. We benefited from it. We're standing on the shoulders of the folks who five decades ago added to the building. Many of them are ancestors of these parishes and maybe they are relatives that you know who helped do that work and God bless them for having the foresight to do it. So the question is, is it our turn now, and it's a question, is it our turn to take on this challenge and carry it forth so that there is a Catholic education program 50, 75, 100 years from now? So let's go to page 12, and I'm gonna ask Mark to come up. He's gonna provide some visuals here that'll tie to the booklet, and thanks again for your patience. I am Mark from YHR Partners, and I will walk through the four options that we have. We have, uh, we have two options for remodeling the existing school and addressing the needs, and two new options. So I'll kind of walk through those. Uh, last year, we were hired by the church and school to do a condition assessment. We call it a technical condition assessment. So we walked through the whole school building and did an assessment of all the the roof, the walls, the mechanical system. We have mechanical electrical engineers here. So we looked at all aspects of the school and came up with a comprehensive list of what you know needed to be done to address deficiencies in the building and repairs and things like that. So uh, the areas we have shaded on these plan options are kind of where there's physical changes to the building. 
that address some of those issues. There are other, in the other areas that are still white, there's still issues like the mechanical systems and finishes and lighting and things like that that we would still be doing. And I'll go through that when we get to that list later on. We have a list of all the projects that would be addressed uh, on up, upcoming page. But I'll walk through this option. Uh, we have two options for remodeling in addition. This one is uh, where you see the green area at the far south end of the building there. That is where we would add an elevator that would connect those nine different levels of the building. So we'd provide handicapped accessibility with a small addition on the south side. Mark, excuse me, that's page 12, 13, page 14? Page tw 12, 13, and 14 here. So uh, page 12, you'll see that's the first floor. And with that option, there would also be an uh, entrance towards the parking lot on the south side. So you could conveniently access the school with a new entrance off of the south side instead of kind of coming around here. But this also allowed accessibility to all floors of the building. Now, with both of these options, we have the elevator kind of on the south end. The only portion of the building that wouldn't be handicapped accessible would be these two rooms on the second floor. And they're kind of on a split level. Uh, right now, they're just used for storage rooms. They were classrooms at one time, but that would be the only portion of it. So about 90% of the building would be handicapped accessible if we did this addition. Uh, along with that, so we kind of made a new entry and then we extended this long north-south hallway all the way down to connect to that entrance on the south side. So when we do that, we provided kind of a, a secure entrance into the parish offices and then you go up here and then you can get into the school offices. So for visitors into the school, we, we created a vestibule in here. So in most new school buildings, we'll have a secure vestibule where a visitor will walk in and then they'll have to check in and get electronic do locks on the doors and they'll get checked in through the office and then led into the school. So that adds to uh, school security. And that was another part of the whole project. We put electronic security on all the exterior doors that could be monitored from the office, so which doesn't exist right now. Uh, and then there's a, over here on this door into the south, these west door into the parish, there's a handicap ramp there. Uh, and then in all the rest of the school, we were talking about upgrading finishes in classrooms and doing lighting and new LED lighting and HVAC. Now the biggest part of this project is obviously the HVAC and the boiler and the boiler piping. And when we get to the numbers, you'll see that. So that's the most significant part of this. And then up on the upper levels, uh, we have that little addition with the elevator and access to the classrooms on second floor. And then up here, you'd go through the library and connect to the, the third level where most of the upper level classes are. So that's option one. Yeah. Oh, the bathrooms, yes. I forgot about I forgot about that. So right here on this option, there's a boys and girls handicapped accessible restroom. And those are in the area, if you're familiar with, there's a couple of old abandoned locker rooms kind of on the south in the basement level. So in that area, we created a couple of handicapped accessible restrooms. So there'd be handicapped accessible restrooms, which don't exist in the school right now. So option two is similar. Uh, some of the ideas we had are similar to option one, but this one, we put the elevator in that area where the lockers were down here on the south end. There's, a, there's two lockers on the lower level here. We put the elevator kind of within the, inside, in, within the building. So there's no addition to build the elevator. Uh, so the elevator is right here accessed off of this hallway. It goes up. The negative of this one, it, we have two classrooms up here. We have to take some square footage, some area out of each one of those classrooms to get the elevator in Mark, up to those levels. 15, 16, 17. Yeah, 15, 16, 17, option two. So you'll see to get the elevator going up, it eats into some of the classroom space. Over here, the school security issues, we're still dealing with that. And then down on the lower level, there's a kind of a ramp that goes down to get to the preschool and then an extra room where that, like a boys locker room sits there right now. With this option, instead of the bathrooms here, we decided to look at doing two restrooms up in the north end. So we're gonna take out kind of a storage room and it, it's on a split level. So it's gonna eat into the room on the second floor because the floor levels are split. So, but on the first level that was added in 1953, there'd be two bathrooms added there. So boys and a girls bathroom. And that's all within kind of the uh, envelope of the existing building. And then with this option, like I said, all the other uh, mechanical issues and finish issues would be taken care of.
All right, then everyone asks, you know, if you're going to spend all this money to remodel the school, what does it cost to build a new school? So we were asked to look at what it would take to build a new school. Luckily, uh, there's plenty of land uh, on the block here to build a new school on the east side. So this shows a brand new school built on the east side in the field east of the existing school. So approximately where this gray area is right here, that's where the existing school sits right now. So we are proposing to look at building a one, one section, that's one classroom per grade school, basically what you have right now uh, over on the east side. This, would call, this shows a, a bus drop off and some new parking on the east side so the bus buses would drop off, off of the street, they wouldn't happen on the street, and then a new entry would happen on the south side into the school. So this would be the front entry of the school, small lobby, there's offices for the school uh, administration, and then the purple is the uh, parish office. So they would share kind of common workroom and staff room and things like that in the middle. And then in this option, the gym is in the middle with the stage and a music room, kind of in the middle area. And then in the green on the east and the north side are the classrooms. They go from the pre-K up to the sixth grade. And there are two extra classrooms in case one grade is larger. Sometimes you'll have, you know, two classes of second grade or two classes of third grade or something like that. So we thought it would be good to have two extra classrooms to kind of accommodate that. And then on the far southeast corner, there's a discussion about possibly having a daycare or a multi-generational space. So we included that with a small playground off of it for the daycare in case that was a need or needed to be built. On the east side, off the lobby, there's a multi-purpose room, library, and then the gray is kind of mechanical rooms and receiving and things like that, and restrooms. So this would allow the new school to be built, the old school would be torn down, and that would be turned into green space and playground over on the east side. And the existing parking that's here remains. And then we have some images of the outside, so. That's page 20. Page 20. So this is option one on the outside. These are just some quick images we did, nothing's final. So this shows the kind of the lobby and the main entry and the offices. And this shows from the, the, the east side, kind of the southeast side. We were talking about doing it out of brick possibly to kind of match or blend in with the church uh, in the additions that were added to the church. And so we'd have the same kind of brick, same kind of a roof, probably have a sloped metal roof on it. That's what we're thinking on this. Okay, then we have option two, which page is that? Page 19? Yes. Yes, so option two, very similar to option one. We just discussed flipping the gym over on the playground side so you could provide easy access to the outside for the gym. And then we moved all the multi-purpose room, library, music room to the inner, inner areas so they'd be closer to the classrooms. So there's pros and cons of both these options. The classroom arrangement stays pretty much the same and the offices stayed the same. The drop off and everything is identical. On both of these options, this option is probably easier. We were talking about providing the lobby and the gym so it could be secured off from the rest of the academic places in the school. So that it could be used for basketball and things like that or nighttime activities and then people can wander around the school building. Uh, the gym we have on both these options would be larger than the gym that's over there. That's the gym that's over there is not a regulation size gym. So this would be built so be an 84 foot basketball court. So you could have basketball, regulation basketball games in that gym. So that's, that's kind of that option. The exterior looks pretty much the same. You can just see the gym is over on the right hand side on that page. All right. Now I'll go through the next page. What page have? 22. On page 22, we have a breakdown of option one, and then the next page is option two of the cost. So in the yellow items, those are all kind of the, the cost for building an elevator, uh, remodeling the entries and making accessible restrooms, doing secure entries. Uh, you'll see the biggest costs on those are the, on this one, we'd have to build an addition 
to build an elevator and an entry. So that's, you know, eight or 900,000 to build that addition and put that elevator on the outside. And then some of the uh, finish upgrades and things like that that are listed uh, kind of go down. The other big item on there is the 300,000 for tuck pointing the outside. So the outside of the building as part of our condition assessment needs to be tuck pointed. So the mortar has to be replaced. It's been there for a hundred years and that's about the lifetime of it. And it kind of, it's a maintenance thing that needs to be done. The blue items are all the mechanical items. Uh, we got from prices from our mechanical engineers. So we included looking at putting a fire sprinkler system in the building, it's 115,000. And then the biggest item on this whole list on the next one is the replacement of the boiler, the piping, the controls, installing HVAC and air conditioning and ventilation. So. You'll see that's a that's a big item also the sanitary sewer piping a lot of the cast iron waste piping for the sewer is deteriorating and needs to be replaced so that that was included to be replaced in this the green items are all electrical items uh, we the fire alarm system is antiquated in the school so our, the electrical engineers would recommend replacing that with a, one that would meet current standards uh, so it's a new fire alarm system new exit lighting uh, part of the boiler replacement and the upgrades for air conditioning and things like that would require a 400 amp electrical service to the building, so that number is included in there. And then we looked at doing some minor upgrades to outlets and adding outlets and doing LED lighting and lighting controls in classrooms. So that project, if you did the remodeling, construction costs would range from about 3.7 to about 4.2 million dollars. And then you'll see there's a bunch of soft costs that add on fees contingencies, things like that. We included inflation in there because inflation is crazy right now. So that would be a project of about 5.2 to $6 million. Uh, the next page, which is 23, is the one that's less expensive because the, uh, the L, it's exactly the same issues as the first one. The only difference is we're not doing that entry and elevator addition. The elevator is within the fabric of the existing building, so it costs less. So that's only about 125 to 150,000 to add an elevator. So that, this option is a little less. The bottom line on that was about 3.2 to 3.7 million. Total project cost would be about 4.5 to 5.2. Okay. Go to the next. The next page is what it costs to build a new school. So a new school. With the school's about 31,000, the one that's proposed on these plans, 31,500. Current costs for schools, and we've bid a couple of them in the last couple months, are running around $270 a square foot. That's not a fancy school, that's still pretty plain. Uh, so the school base construction cost would be about 8.5 million. We have to have some money in there for demolishing the old school, 200,000. An allowance for site work and some parking works, 400,000. So total school straight construction cost would be about 9.1 million. And then we have fees and contingencies and soft costs and things like that. So a budget for the school would be in the range of about $12.8 million to build a new school. So people ask, what is, well, if you're doing all this work on the existing building, what does it cost to build a new school? So that's, we went through that exercise to show that. At the bottom of page 24, we've done a kind of a list of strengths and weaknesses of each option. So option one, the remodeling and addition option, the strengths on it are handicapped accessibility to most of the school via an elevator. Uh, there's handicapped access to the parish offices. There's new handicapped accessible restrooms. There's new HVAC system, that's boiler and air conditioning and things like that. Uh, there's access uh, on the addition to the south parking lot there's also improved security, so we would improve the, all the door security and the school security. Upgrades to the classroom for lighting, electrical. The strengths on that is it maintains the existing building. So you maintain the existing building, that's, there's uh, some sentimentality and historic uh, character of the existing building it gets maintained. It addresses all the condition issues that were in our report that we did. And uh, there's a it would add a fire sprinkler and uh, life and fire alarm system proof safety for the students. Weaknesses is many of the improvements, those all those condition assessment improvements, mechanical systems, boiler piping, boilers, no one sees those. So they're not visible to people, but they're necessary, but people don't see them. Some of the old issues and configuration of the existing school remain. 
Uh, the building has nine different levels. You're not going to get rid of that. Uh, and the build, existing building's not really arranged for current educational standards on mo how modern schools are laid out. So it still would have the same layout of a, of a 1927 building. Uh, and it doesn't really address any future needs for the school. It kind of just maintains what's here. Uh, option two remodeling, where we're putting the elevator in the inside, there is the, uh, the strengths and weaknesses are the same as the option one, except for strengths, because we're not adding an addition onto it, we're putting an elevator in the exist inside the existing building. It's the least expensive option, but the strengths and weaknesses are the same. Uh, then on the new education center, strengths are it includes you know many of the strengths of options one and two. Uh, the new construction, it'd be more uh, beneficial for students and for flow, it's all built on one level. There's more flexibility. Uh, it's more accommodating for kind of 21st century methods of teaching. We have some spaces in there that would kind of accommodate collaboration and other uh, small group rooms and things that the existing school does not have. So it would be more accommodating to kind of methods of teaching these days. Uh, the existing building can remain while the new school is built, so that's a strength. And the new school would be built with all modern technology and energy efficient systems in the building. Like I said uh, previously, the, the gym would be a regulation sized gym, which could be secured off for community use. The bus and auto drop offs off the street. And uh, also had a child care space with its own entry. Weaknesses on that option, it's the highest cost, so it's expensive. And then you also lose the historic uh, sentimentality of the existing building. So that would be gone. I'll turn it back over to Hal. Well, as I look out to you and your faces, I can think of two words, sticker shock. Uh, it's pretty ambitious in terms of any of these projects to, to remedy what you're doing and, and what you currently have to change the options or build new. But I want to give you some context on the next couple of pages and then we'll wrap up to get you out of those chairs into some uh, brief uh, refreshments and, and then we'll move to the questions. But this chart on page 25, this wheel, this is a responsible uh, and flexible tool that I hope will give you some confidence and comfort. Uh, it's called the steps in determining feasibility and affordability. And we're only in the feasibility steps right now. So it begins with up at 12 o'clock between 12 and two, that's step one, where all of this data was gathered uh, from previous research as well as what YHR did. And then step two prepared this document to deliver it during these meetings. And step three is now where we are in the feasibility meetings with the third of four gatherings. But also included in step three will be then those confidential interviews that follow and the survey that we will send to those who are not part of the profiles that we uh, select for the interviews. At the conclusion of those three pieces, we then deliver our report and recommendations and that puts you at that star where it's literally six o'clock on the chart. That's the end of the feasibility study and our services. If there's confidence to move ahead to actually raise funds, you would move into step four. That's the capital campaign. And in a kind of a traditional approach to things, we could take votes or ask people to raise hands. Are you in favor of this or that? But in our view, after 48, almost 49 years of doing the work, the real measure of a community's commitment is, can we raise the money? And that would be done in step four. That's really where the rubber hits the road. So if you were to have a capital campaign, you would raise it in step four. Then you'll see another star right around eight o'clock in the, in the chart. That is a pause to say, what did we raise? How much of this can we accomplish? Do we have to make adjustments based on the ability to raise the money? And then you would move into step five. And here is where you would take these contractor conceptual cost estimates that Mark reviews on pages 22, 23, and 24, and actually put them to bid. That's where you'll see the real number of what it would cost, because now you have the money to do the work, and you're ready to proceed in a timely way when a bid would be uh, potential, uh, would be accepted. You also have to take this to the diocese. 
because there again, as we described earlier, they're your corporate partner. So the bishop and the vicar general, along with your pastor and two trustees, have to take the results of this, the bids, and put it out on what's called a cash flow pro forma sheet. And that will say, what can we afford to do without impacting the day-to-day -day operations of the parish? The diocese, and I want you to be cognizant of this, is going to require that 75% of the cost of a project has to be in cash. I think that's a very high bar, but it's gonna prevent you from theoretically diving into a pool of water and there's no water there. It's gonna prevent you from having a serious problem of mortgaging something and you don't have the funds to pay for it. So they make that 75% as a protection for you and obviously the diocese as well. The other 25% needs to be in pledges or in some type of financing, if you mortgaged out, say 25%. But again, the dollars don't reflect any type of interest cost if you took out a mortgage. So we're trying to be very clear here where that high water mark is. So you bring that to the diocese in step five with your approvals and the dollars raised, and then and only then would you start in step six to start the work, whatever option was chosen. So folks, we're a long way I don't want you to feel that this is a runaway train of some kind, it's on a fast track. If you stay within each step, you're never gonna get in trouble in terms of balancing fiscal responsibility with forward thinking. Just stay within the step and, and you won't trip over yourselves. On the right-hand side, we've really covered that earlier in the explanation of the feasibility study. I'll let you read that at your own pace. Let's turn up to page 26. We put together a half a dozen questions, and maybe some of you have already looked ahead to those questions, and they're thoughtful answers that we want to provide, uh, and we'll let you read this at your own pace, uh, because they may answer some things, but they're kind of the start of our discussion in a few moments. So when we began this afternoon, we talked about taking a break. Now's the time for that. If I could ask you to stand, please, and get out of those uncomfortable chairs, stretch a little bit, and please pray this prayer with me, which is at the bottom of page 26 on the right-hand side. And this prayer is focusing clearly on St. Anne's Catholic Church and School, but remember the prayer is really designed for the entire area community. So join with me in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. Please join, loving God, we are the people of St. Anne's Catholic Church and School are grateful for all the blessings you have given our parish family. We are thankful to all who have gone before us, who have supported our ministries, built our facilities, and created the faith community we now benefit from. We know that we are stewards of this legacy, and we ask for your wisdom and guidance as we shape the future of our parish. We join together to live out our mission centered in Jesus Christ, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Let's take three, four, five minutes at most. Use the restrooms, help yourself to the refreshments, and do take a look at the drawings over to my left here. Uh, they are enlargements of what's in your book. And then stay with us for the most important part, which is your comments and questions. Thanks, folks. If, if you are ready to start, what we'd like to do is, uh, my wife and colleague Katie is going to be posting all the comments and questions you have up on the flip chart, uh, and Father, excuse me, is going to go around with a microphone, Mark has another one, so what we'd like you to do is raise your hand, and we'll bring the microphone to you, and then please let us know your comment or question. So who has the first comment or question they'd like to share? Gentlemen right here. My comment is, <clears throat> excuse me, what condition is the roof of the present school? What condition well, is yes, the roof? That has in... to be something that's going to have to be done there, which will increase the cost okay. of the renovation. I'm going to ask Mark the... to talk about the roof and the structure okay. itself. The structure of the building is fine. There's mm -hmm. no structural problems. The roof, I think when I looked at the condition report, we gave it a 6 out of 10, so it's okay. You know? What would it cost to replace it? Well, I'd have to look into that, so I don't know off the top of my head. But. 
it will last another at least 10 years. So it's not an immediate need. So when we, on, on our condition report, when we looked at that, we kind of do, we put numbers to anything that's like five and below. So things that are above five, usually they're gonna last another 10 years or so. So it's not immediate. But your question, we posted it and we'll find out the answer of what would a new roof cost? Yeah, That'll be part of the information we get. Other comments or questions you'd like to ask? I want to mention that. Okay. Tom mentioned me, I should mention that YHR, our firm, not me, but 25 years ago when this work was done, we did some work, we did the, a gathering edition, our firm did. We did a condition assessment of the school and the church back then. And when I came back last year, I took that report from 20 some years ago and looked at it in comparison to the current issues and not much was taken care of. <laughs> So there's been a few things. There's been some roofing repairs, some window repairs. Uh, there's been the gym floor was replaced, bleachers were put in, some lighting work. But most of the issues from 1999 in that report still exist today. So, yeah. Other comments or questions you have? Right there, Father? Oh, and then the young lady. Go ahead, sir. Uh, the design of the building, where did we start with that and who is, where are we going to go with that as in like St. John's School over in Redwood, in my opinion, is a real simple design mm -hmm. and what is that compared to a building like this on cost? Okay, so your comment is how did this design originate? Where might we be going? That's part of the feedback we're asking. And part of your feedback is also, you gave us a comparison of St. John's and Redwood as being an adequate building, uh, that maybe not the term you use, but a fine design. And what would that kind of a building cost compared with something like this? I'm gonna turn that to Mark. I have no idea what St. John's and Redwood looks like or have seen it, so I can't really say, I can't really comment on that. This building is very simple. It's one story, slab on grade. We're showing in these images the most complicated side of it, but the other three sides, are, it's square. It's a square box, so it's very simple. And so I can't really comment on how it compares to the building in Redwood because I haven't seen it, so, and we weren't involved with that. But again, just like this gentleman's question, it's posted, we're gonna follow up and find out when they built that. Would anyone know when that was constructed, just roughly? Five years ago. About five years ago. Five years ago, okay. So let's get the cost from five years ago, what it cost, and maybe maybe a footprint to look at it. So you get an apples and apples comparison to your question, okay? And then on Please. some of these buildings, they spend more money on the entryway than they do the rest of it, mm -hmm. to where, my opinion, I don't, I don't know, just something to look at, that they don't need to spend a million dollars on the entryway when we got classrooms that need supplies and other things. So you're advocating the more practical approach for visual and entrance and put the dollars into what the children and the teachers need in terms of the materials and technology. Great, Katie, are you I catching all that? You yep. got it, young lady there. And then I think this gentleman is next, Mark. Mark, the cost of the $270 per square foot, is that today's? Cost, that's like with the inflation that's, figured in. That's today's cost, right? Today. Okay. In those numbers, you'll see at the bottom of that numbers list, I got an inflation factor in there too. So but you're figuring this project may, if it takes three to four years. If it takes years, three years, I have 20%, 20%. I got 20% inflation for three years from now. Yeah. Okay, thank you. At the current rate, that would probably be conservative. But. And let's just make sure we're, we're all clear on that. If you go back to pages 22, uh, at 23, if you do that for just a moment, the very last line at the bottom of both uh, uh, options in terms of the description says inflation factor, two to three years, 20%. That's those dollars built in in both to give you that grand total of a project budget. And why three years? A gentleman asked me during the break, kind of how does this work and what's kinds of timing? A three-year capital commitment seems to be, from our experience almost 50 years now, uh, the sweet spot. 
If you ask people to write a check today, I think nearly all of us can't do that because we have so many other things on our plate. But if you spread it out over four or five years to pay off, you'll raise more money in that time frame, but the cost of this will get away from you. You, you won't be able to recover the increase in cost with the uh, extension of the pledges. So less than three years really puts people under pressure to write a check now, to, to learn this information and suddenly come up with dollars immediately. Giving three years to pay it off allows those with the opportunity to give money up front, they can do that, but for the majority of us, you gotta build this into your plate. And remember, uh, we didn't maybe make it crystal clear here, but this has to be money that's above and beyond what you presently contribute to the church. If you take it out of one pocket from the Sunday collection and move it over to a building, these lights are gonna go dark, it's gonna get real cold in the winter in here, and, and you'll hurt your day-to-day -day operations. So this is a big, big ambitious uh, project here, and we wanna be realistic about it. So gentleman has a question. Question mark, um, I noticed in the reporting, it didn't come up about, what about the savings on operation of the building from the old building? Would anything be added to the old building to save on heating and cooling costs compared to the new building? Would it be more efficient and that's yeah, I mean, the, the, the systems are going to be more efficient, but I always have to tell people they're in the project we were adding air conditioning. So, and with that comes ventilation of the building. So the cost to provide air conditioning is going to increase your energy costs. Right now, the building is heated with a boiler and hot water radiators. There's no ventilation. So as soon as you add air conditioning, you got to ventilate, you got to cool and heat that ventilation air. So your costs are, would be higher in the existing building if you add those systems. To the building so those systems would be energy efficient more energy efficient than the ones that are there now like the boiler and things like that and then we were adding uh we were replacing all the lighting with led lighting so that's going to bring down electrical costs too so it would bring down some but you wouldn't see a savings in your heat bill or your or your energy bill i can just just to clarify that but your question is leading to something that would be important what are the operating costs once these options might be considered. We don't have that information today, but for option one, two, or a new building, let's see if we can come together with utility costs, cleaning costs, with those types of things that are for the day-to-day -day maintenance. I think that would be helpful. One other thing, and I just, I don't want to dominate the conversation in any way, but if you install an elevator in remodel option one or two, or obviously you don't need to do that in a new building, you're gonna have the maintenance of that elevator. It has to be inspected every year. It's gotta have a qualified engineer come in and look at it. So there's a maintenance cost to that value of, of being able to have accessibility. We'll build that into the operating costs so you get that number as well, okay? Great questions, great comments. Anything, other, other comments or questions from folks It couldn't be that good a presentation, folks. <laughs> but I also know you. this is a work day for many of you. This gentleman. I'm wondering on um, a new building versus the uh, fix it, fixing up, um, the difference in uh, life years. Um, if we're fixing up, is it half, half or a third? I think uh, that was the question was asked last night, too. I think, I mean, we're going to bring the current building up to, a, and it's lasted for 100 years. I would say a new building would last a similar amount of time. It would be a 75 to 100 year building versus the old building. And the old building, the, the fix up of the old building, we'd make it, bring it up to kind of current building standards. So it would last another 75 to 100 years. Does that answer your question? Yeah. And the only thing I would add is keep in mind, and I, I'm not selling here, but keep in mind, you're not going to eliminate the nine different levels It'll still be this historic building that's been here 100 years with its nine levels and the configuration of the rooms the way they are. But it will be structurally sound and, and up to codes, as, as Mark is saying. Gentlemen, right here. The committee that puts the money together, is that you guys or is that a committee within our parish? Great question. Let's go to the uh, wheel on page 25. So the question is, who 
actually puts together the funds. In step four, if you choose to move through a capital campaign, you absolutely categorically have the chance to do this on your own. You can organize the campaign, you can try to do this entirely on your own. If you choose to hire a group like ours, we would help you, it would be a fee to do that, and then we do not go out and solicit the funds for a couple of reasons. If Katie or I knocked on your door and said, we're really nice people, but we're not members of your parish, will you contribute to this project? You're gonna say, who are you? You're being paid to do this. What we do would be to train the volunteers in the parish to do that work based on 318 projects, our, our 48 years. But the parishioners have to be the ones to do the invitation because the relationship is already there. It's peer to peer. So again, I say you can have this entire campaign be done by your parishioners or you can hire someone to do it. There's four, four real reasons that you'd want to consider hiring someone. And I don't want to get into a sales thing here, but just let me give you that food for thought. Number one, you don't have the time to do it in terms of organizing. Number two, you may not have the knowledge of what to do. Number three, with the time and the knowledge, you may not know how the steps should be done in sequence so you don't get partway down a direction to say, all right, I gotta go back up and start over again. If you have the time, the knowledge, and the confidence to do the steps in the right direction, the only other reason to hire someone from the outside is it's tough to be a prophet in your own land. What does that mean? Well, that's a parishioner, and he's one of us, and he or she is giving us direction on how to do that. We've tried to do that for 37 years in our church, and people will say to us, well, people hire you to do this, but you're just one of us and it doesn't get very far. But if you can cover those four areas, folks, you can do this on your own. There's nothing pressuring you. Katie, go ahead. Do you wanna use the I mic? Would, no, I would just mention the confidentiality aspect. Oh, let's talk about uh, the confidentiality, and I'll touch on the, the question here. Um, if you go to page 26, the question number five, you'll see a bold statement at the top of page 26, question five, it says the campaign would be personally inviting support from all members through a well-organized, a very dignified, respectful, and confidential process. No one would ever be told whether to or what to contribute. Why? Because we're all blessed differently. It's a very personal thing to make a decision on what you can potentially afford. Every one of you is blessed differently this afternoon than you were a few years ago, or you will be in the coming years. So it must be whatever you do on your own or hiring someone, it has to be well organized, dignified, respectful, and it must be confidential. This isn't about putting plaques up to show who contributed what. You're a community, you're all together. So that would be our philosophy. I hope that answered your question, sir. I'm curious if we know at this point if we would have a financial commitment from the diocese in the wall. Okay, the question is, would we have a commitment from the Diocese of New Ulm? And I can tell you categorically from my experience, but I'm gonna ask Father to comment as well, they don't have any money. Uh, and I don't mean to be flippant or sarcastic about that, but we're asked in every project, will this diocese or chancery or whatever, will the bishop give any money? They're going to give you that permission and make sure you can show your business plan to make sure you're not going into debt adversely but other than that and maybe some additional support no i do believe this that they do not tax as an assessment your building fund and father's nodding his head so from that standpoint you will get some aid from the diocese by not taxing this money because it's dedicated to the building Great questions, great comments. Other things you want to offer this afternoon? Please. Uh, second question, can I assume based on the location, uh, if a new school was built, that the old school would stay and be used until completion of the new one? That is correct. And then I think, Mark, you were clear that the new, or the former school would become the playground. 
Yes, it would just flip the spaces. So, can you show that? Oh, yeah. The gray area on there is where the school sits right now on the left hand side. Okay. What would happen if they were getting the money together and only a small percentage of the money became available from the community? So, like, say a million dollars. Um, what would happen to that money and which direction would we be forced to go? I'm going to come back to that page on the wheel, which is page 25. And I'll say this as I say in every project, that wheel is your best friend because it will protect you from what the gentleman's saying. So let's say you folks and the collective wisdom is, all right, let's try to raise the money. And you go into step four, you start the capital campaign, and you only raise a million dollars, is that what you're saying from that? You have to pause at that point and make a decision and come back to the people, in my view, and you tell me if you would agree with this, I would hold a meeting of all the people who offered support, whether it was a dollar or $5 million, or in this case, a million dollars. Ask those people to come back together because they're the shareholders. They're the ones who helped to fund this and ask their opinion and maybe give them several options. Should we hold the money in escrow until we can try to raise more? Should we go ahead and complete some of the projects that are on the immediate docket, like the tuck pointing or, or the boiler, things like that? You'd hold that meeting before you would move to step five or step six. And that's kind of a worst case scenario, okay? If we climb the hill and we only get part way, and we peter out, what do we do then? But that money, in my view, professionally, and Katie, correct me or uh, challenge this, um, that should never be used for an operating fund or this fund or that. That's dedicated money for the education program. But you bring the shareholders together. Now, why am I saying that versus talk to the whole parish? Well, if I have an offered financial support and I'm rendering an opinion, you see what I'm saying? I'm not sure that holds a lot of water. But if I've invested a dollar or more to help with this, ask my opinion. Does that seem fair? Just a quick show of hands. Okay, that's my approach. Now ask me, has that ever happened? Yes, but not to something of what you're trying to accomplish. You have to have some pretty strong evidence that you're gonna be able to climb this hill, okay? But the only way to find that is to conduct a capital campaign. Did that answer the question? Thanks. Other comments or questions you have? Very helpful. Anybody who hasn't had the chance? Oh, let me start before you ask. Um, I don't want to cut you off. Anyone who hasn't had a chance before we come back to this gentleman? Well, that killed it, didn't it? <laughs> Please, go ahead. I guess I'll go. I'm just curious if we've done any studies on a potential expansion of uh, going from just K through six to maybe K through eight, adding a potential junior high school of Catholic education. Okay, have we done studies relative to adding, I guess, middle school, the, the K through eight? And I'm gonna turn to Mary as the school principal. Uh, we have not, nothing official. Um, certainly there's been talk of it, you know, like bring up in conversation, um, but not at this time. I would point out that we have a, you know, if we build new, looking at adding additional classrooms for possible expansion to the future. Um, the only real concrete things we've looked at are pre-K, so. Is there a big difference in accreditation and things if you start to look at that? Yes. The, the question was, is there a big difference in terms of accreditation if you start to look at expanding the grades? Yeah, probably the biggest thing is um, the teacher qualification requirements um, for going beyond sixth grade. Let me use this as an advertisement. If you feel strongly about adding grades or you know the design of the building as you were talking earlier, making it more simple, whatever, please use this form. It doesn't have to be filled out today but it can be filled out in the days ahead. If you want your name at the bottom for additional contact, let us know, otherwise it can be anonymous. But your involvement in this, in today and in the coming days, is, is hugely important. Yes, sir. 
with your experience and um, in a community like ours, typically how long would it take us to raise enough money for a new building? Okay, let's go back to that famous wheel, page 25. Sorry, it's like a broken record, but it really is your back pocket friend. If you decided to start a capital campaign in uh, step four on that wheel, you could start potentially, let me back up a little bit, we expect that we were, will be delivering the results of this feasibility study, meaning the meetings, the interviews, the survey, and our observations, probably very early in July, okay? Uh, so it's not gonna be months before you're gonna get a report. If there's sufficient evidence to start a capital campaign, theoretically, step four could start later summer, early fall. And for a community your size, you could invite the financial commitments definitely before Thanksgiving, okay? So that you would know what was committed then to be paid over the three years. Now, collecting those funds, if there are significant people who have significant assets to transfer, and suddenly that's cash available, let's talk about one thing in particular. Those of us, and I'm nibbling toward that, 70 and a half and older and 72 and older have the opportunity through an IRA to give to charities like the church and avoid the taxes on that. After age 72, I'm required to do that by the federal government. I just not have the opportunity, but I'm required. That's an immediate influx of dollars in that tax year. It's not a pledge of any kind because they want you to do that. Now, that's one thing where our elders might consider, but can those in the agriculture community, can they offer dairy, grain, potentially livestock, where they would contribute that for the potential tax savings? That is a huge piece. I'll give you an example. In Sauk Center, Minnesota, St. Paul's Catholic Church, this was four, no more than five years ago, a hundred head of cattle, I believe they were $1,200 each at that time. That was delivered to the church, not on the front lawn. <laughs> it would have been a nice picture in the church bulletin. But they took it to the feed lot and they sold it. And that cash was given to the church after the church received it. They also received a couple or three or four truckloads of dairy and the same of beans or, and, and, and grain. So... Just by planting that seed, if I can say it that way, people said, well, I can't write you a check for it, but I can give a commodity. So how much of that aspect would be part of this? Those are immediate gifts. That's your cash to build up that 75% the diocese needs. But if you were to book the campaign commitments in step four by Thanksgiving, it may be a year or two, maybe three, before you would collect all of those unless people could accelerate it. But the key is, how much can you raise in commitments? Is there a $5 million commitment in this community? I don't know that. Would there be $3 million? I don't know that. Would there be a half a dozen people who could offer a half a million to a million dollars in terms of a commitment spread over a period of time? We don't know any of that. But the way I look at this, this is a legacy project. If people say, this community educated my children and they're grown and moved on, I want to make sure Catholic education is around and quality safe education, uh, here's a chance to do it. This is that moment. But you're going to help us decide that. Gentlemen here. What about reaching out to those people well, who have moved please, on? Please, Mark. I'm sorry. Thank you. How about reaching out to those people that have all graduated from here that throughout the United States? Because there's got to be a, some successful people out there with a bundle of money. The question is, what about coming back to our alumni who have graduated and moved on? It's a great suggestion. The key is the data. Do we have that? But here's a way to look at something as well. If those members of the parish community, the area faith community, say, I'm going to talk to my family and together we're going to chain together our gifts as a family reaching those former graduates and we'll give a family gift it could be far more substantial quick story my mother died at age 91 
Before she passed away, not once but twice, the local church we uh, were raised in, in South Minneapolis, held a fundraising campaign. If you ever want to have pressure put on you, be the consultant raising the funds in the church you grew up in. You better not screw that one up. Okay? It was right around the corner from where we lived on Upton Avenue. So my mother says, well, I'm going to give $500. And I said, Mom. And she said, well, I know this is your work, but why, why isn't that a big deal? That's what my father and grandfather would have given. And I said, yes, they would have given it when there was a nickel loaf of bread back in that early 1900s. Okay, but she said, well, what would you do? And I said, why don't we talk to my sisters and the four of us, my sisters, myself, and my mom, put together a commitment from our family that's substantial. She said, that's a great idea. Well, we were able to do that. Well, then three years later, the church came along with phase two. And she says, she throws the book at me, now they want more money? <laughs> and of course, we've been asked to direct that too, so I have to sit down and say, and, I, and then she said, sharp memory, she said, and I suppose you're going to say my $500 isn't good enough. <laughs> God rest your soul, Mom, but you know, it was that very idea of coming back to other generations to package those uh, gifts into one. It could be a huge piece. Okay? Great, great comment. We've got it registered. Other thoughts? Thank you for your patience with all this. This is great. Are you comfortable concluding? Are you sensing we've had enough? Right here, please. Um, Mark. Thanks. Need <laughs> You'll need it for me. Uh, well, I'm from reading over the the book briefly and looking at what needs to be done, we're going to need to do a capital campaign of one kind or another. I mean, we've had a tuck pointing fund for how long? And we're not even close to having tuck pointing. Um, so it's more realistic to look at, okay, we need to go forward and let's decide on what option. Because otherwise, are we just going to let the building deteriorate into the basement? You know, um, and, and we look at like one of the options, or two of the options, to bring it up to code. Okay, if, do we even have a choice if we start doing some remodeling <coughs> as far as the, the tuck pointing and the heating system, okay, will the ADA allow us not to put in an elevator? I mean, is that going to be a requirement then? So that's not that's not an option. That's Yeah, you can do repairs on the building and the, the building code they won't okay, make you I put, make it ADA it's accessible. It's not like if you start one project no. it leads to the next no, one if, and the next one. If you added a big addition onto the school Yes, then okay. they would have to make the whole building okay. handicap accessible. But if you're just maintaining and remodeling the existing, no. Okay. Yeah. All right. But, yeah. Okay. I, I'm just saying that this isn't really an option anymore. Yeah. No. Any other comments you want to make, Tom? Go ahead. I just have Mary yeah, address this. Just oh, Mary. Um, I would probably defer to the finance council about the talk pointing question as far as what's been raised. I believe that it's all close to being raised I think it's just sort of sitting there now because now that we're doing this what you know where should we go first so right is am I is that pretty close to being it and then regarding um, reaching out to others absolutely I think that would be no matter what kind of a campaign we do and currently we do have our regular you know newsletter that goes out four times a year, so we have that data, and I would certainly put some focus there, or the committee, or whatever, so. Way in the corner. What's the first shuttle and service move for a new school? What's the timeline to get the building done? So how long would it take to create from start to finish a new building, Mark? I'd say a building like this would probably be about 16 months. Other
other questions you have. So we are just to kind of piggyback with Mrs. Franta or Mary said um, with the idea that uh, we do have we have collected like uh, 70 80,000 of the tuck pointing. Uh, we also um, St. Mary's God bless our prisoners from Seaforth. Uh, our council there decided to take portion of what monies we had left there and also move that to the restoration and whatever that might look at for St. Anne's School. And so that's right around 230, 240,000 as well. So, uh, so, so, so the $300,000 that we were trying to get for the tuck pointing, yes, that portion has been collected. We just haven't advertised it yet because we just don't know where are we going from here with this whole project. So, uh, but now the next thing is a boiler as we heard if you want to go handicap accessibility and all the other things, that's what we need to keep working at raising. But is it fair to say all of that information would come out before you start a capital campaign yes. so that people are aware of their contributions and where, where things at, stand yeah. in terms of accurate numbers? I mean, that's, that's our company's philosophy, total transparency. Anybody else? You ready to conclude? Please. Would this affect the um, tuition cost? Would the tuition go up? Okay, the question is, would this affect tuition in terms of a cost increase taking on any of these options? Again, maybe defer to some of the parish council members, but um, you know, our forefathers that built the school had in their minds that you know, this is a school for whoever wants to come and our goal is to keep tuition as low as possible. Um, it's the lowest in the diocese. It has always been the lowest in the diocese. And um, I think we're like one of the 10 lowest in the state of Minnesota. And certainly that um, ideal would remain. I'm not saying that it's not gonna you know, ever go up. You know, we still have to you know, <laughs> go up for a cost of inflation and all of those things. But um, that is a high priority of our parish at this point. You're not thinking of printing t-shirts that say, yay, we're the lowest, are you? <laughs> Sorry. Poorly, poorly chosen. I should, have, I should have zipped it up, all right? Anybody else? If you're ready, what we'd like to do now is to pass that card out and give you an opportunity to kind of tell us what you're feeling after this information and after the discussion. Again, we'd like each of you to offer your observations Privately, we do not want you to uh, assign your name to this. You can leave it at your place or put it on the table on your way out. But I'm going to ask your cooperation after we pass this out, and I'll walk through um, what we're asking you to complete. And if you were with us on Sunday or last evening at St. Catherine's, please refrain from filling out a second. We've already obviously heard your opinion. So let's look at this first, uh, the top of the statement. This is the presentation dialogue meeting pulse poll. It is not a formal vote. Rather, you're advising parish leaders of your opinion about the education facility. So let's just have the first one read here. Based on my initial impression following this meeting, I believe that we should move forward and take action to remedy the deficiencies in our education facility. Do you strongly agree with that statement, strongly disagree, or do you have an opinion in between? If you would circle one of the five choices. Number two, I believe the following option will best remedy the education facility deficiencies and provide the best long-term value for the potential dollars expended. We're asking you to select one of the four choices. The first would be correct immediate needs at a cost of roughly 4.3 to 4.5 million. Remodel option one, and you can see the cost range there. Remodel option two, and remember option one is the elevator is built on the outside. Option two, the elevator is on the inside. That's the difference in price. Or the new education center at the cost estimate listed. Please select one of those four. Then number three, based on feedback, parish leaders should assess all responses, determine the preferred option, and proceed with planning for a capital campaign. Do you strongly agree with that statement? Strongly disagree? Do you have an opinion in between? Please select one of the five choices under number three. And then finally, based on my feelings right now, I would be willing to offer my financial support to fund the collective preferred option 
if a capital campaign were conducted. Do you strongly agree with that statement? Strongly disagree? Do you have an opinion in between? If you'd make your choices for the four statements, please feel free to add a comment if you wish, but do not sign this because we want total anonymity. If you'll leave that on the way out on the, on the uh, empty table, uh, also the extra booklet, if you don't need that uh, as a, a household, uh, uh, you can bring one home. One more advertising for the comment sheet to take home with you, or if you're ambitious, you can spend a few minutes this afternoon writing your comments. Leave all of that there, and the pencils can go on the table as well. Was this helpful, folks? Thank you very much. Um, how many of you received a phone call uh, to invite you here? Raise your hands. How many of you helped us with those phone calls? Bless you. Thank you. You can see the response we have. If you know of someone who said, I'm not going to bother to go, they, in quotes, have already decided this, please encourage them to come this evening for our final session, which is at 6.30 here at St. Anne's. I'm going to let Father conclude with a prayer and a blessing, and I hope you have a, a wonderful rest of the afternoon. Thanks again for your cooperation. And before I do my final prayer, I just want to thank you all for coming, for your presence, your commitment to our, our Catholic education here at St. Anne's and our area faith community. A uh, special thanks to all who helped with the food, organizing it, and serving it, uh, cleaning up afterwards, and, uh, and also for all of you for your participation as well. Um, thanks to our, our committees, our councils that helped make today what it was as well. If you ever have questions, again, as you see on the front cover there, our, um, our, you know, those who are involved in this process, uh, talk to you know, any of us, uh, Mary or Chris, our business manager, um, if you have questions, or myself as well. But I just want to close this opportunity to thank also Mark, Hal, and Katie. Um, let's give them a round of applause for their presentation and help. Us out. do appreciate uh, Al Johnson Associates because I know one of the things that we went to them with uh, just because we had no idea how to go forward with this and so we do thank you for the guidance that you gave as well as to YHR for their direction as well as some um, thoughtful advice. So let's close with a prayer. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Oh good teacher, we have gathered together in your name seeking guidance, wisdom, and support as we reflect on our past 100 year history and accomplishments and look ahead to working together to promote a brighter future for our school and faith formation program. Lord, grant us courage, boldness, and discernment as we continue to engage in meaningful discussion in an effort to grow closer as an area of faith community. Guide our minds and hearts throughout these next few months, weeks, and months so that we work for the good of our students and our community. Fill us with the grace of the Spirit and continue to remind us that all that we do and accomplish is for the pursuit of truth and for the greater glory of you and for the service of humanity. Help us to grow in peace and understanding with one another. Lord, we thank you for the blessings that you have bestowed upon St. Anne's School, our parish, and our area faith community. Help us to realize how thankful we are to have such a wonderful institution and that God's presence accompanies, accompanies us each day of the year. In closing, bless our students, families, friends, teachers, staff, parish, and administration with the gifts of kindness, patience, love, and respect. Give us the grace to share these gifts. Empower us to enjoy the beginning of the summer now, whether at work or on vacation, before welcoming the students back next fall. Lord, we bring before you these prayers and the prayers that we hold silently in our hearts. Help us so that we always enter our school to learn Christ and exit our doors to serve Christ. We ask all this in your name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. May Almighty God bless you all, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Have a great afternoon. Thank <laughs> you.